So I'm just going to day three to the subsetting data slides here. And please let me know if anything is too small. Um, I would like today to have a R out as well, R Studio, so that I can go through some, some of what we're doing. So how does that view look? Is it good? Okay, I'm gonna assume that's, that's good. Otherwise, please shout out. I see a chat there. Oh, a question about the Slack, would we keep it up afterwards? So yeah, we have kept it up for actually several months afterwards. We're not necessarily very good about checking it after a while, uh, but we do usually check it um, for quite a while. So I think we checked it pretty regularly for about a month after last time. All right, so uh, we're gonna cover a lot of topics today. Um, I'm gonna, try to go through it concisely and clearly as much as I can. Um, and I think a lot of this stuff is really important. So we're, we're gonna show you how to look at your data in, in some other ways than what we've already covered. We're gonna talk about, we've talked a bit about data frames and tibbles, but we're gonna go a little bit more in depth about that and how to create them. We're gonna talk about creating new variables, um, making row names, which might be unclear what a row name is, but making those into columns that will hopefully become clear soon. Renaming columns, taking just a sample of rows out of a data frame, taking just a sample of columns, um, removing and adding new columns, ordering columns, and ordering rows. So uh, let's get started. So again, um, this is gonna involve a lot of packages from, from Tidyverse. The Tidyverse is super, super helpful for wrangling data. So that's why we're using it. Um, so later after the class, if you're not loading the package that we have had you load and you can't remember the name of that package and you wanna do something else, you can just load the Tidyverse. Um, and when you load Tidyverse, it's going to load uh, the dplyr package. And this is the hex sticker for the Tidyverse. So the dplyr package is called dplyr because the D stands for data frames and the plyr part is to evoke pliers. Um, so this is Hadley Wickham who helped <laughs> create the dplyr package. He works at our studio. And uh, so you can kind of think of it as this really helpful tool for, for tweaking your data. Um, so you can kind of visualize these, these pliers that you're gonna apply to your data. So if you were to load Tidyverse, again, just to remind you, the library function will load that library or that package. In this case, Tidyverse is a package of packages. So it's a lot of different pieces of code that get loaded. And so you'll see things like this where it's telling you that it's attaching all these different packages. Um, and sometimes it also will report conflicts. And all this means is that you have um, in this case, dplyr and the stats package have the same, have some functions that have the same name. And so um, that's just something to keep in mind. If you really wanted to use the stats filter function, then you would need to type this before you, you write filter. Okay, so first we wanna get some data to work with. Um, Automatically, when you load R, there's going to be some data sets that come with it. We've shown this a little bit. I think yesterday, Ava used the Iris data set for just a bit. Um, and today, we're going to use the MT cars data uh, for a lot of what we're doing. And so, if we type in MT cars, we see that we have some data here. It's not super large, but not super small. Um, and it's got all these different names of cars as row names. So that means that it's, you notice that there's no column name above it. Um, it's, it's just uh, the names of the rows. And then we have all these different variables about various features of these cars. So if you're into cars, then maybe you'll really like this data. Um, and so, but we don't wanna 
modify this original data frame uh, from R. So we're going to make a copy of it like this. And so now if I do head data frame, I'll see the, the same thing as I would if I did head MTRs. So now we're just going to work with data frame because um, that way we're not going to change empty cars. Okay, so I think we touched on some of these a little bit yesterday, but just to more formally introduce them, we have some functions that are really helpful to figure out the size of your data. And one of them is DIM, which stands for dimensions. So if we're running DIM data frame, we see that it has 32 rows and 11 columns. So it's always rows first and columns second. If you can't quite remember which one's which, you can use um, n row or number of row function. You see that it's 32. And of course, the number of columns is 11. Um, another function that's part of the dplyr package that's also helpful for taking a look at your data is the glimpse function. We just talked about head. Um, there's also the tail function, which we briefly introduced on the first day, which will show you the last part of your data frame. But if you wanted to try it out, the glimpse function will display your data in a slightly different way. So it actually rotates everything around. It displays the number of rows and the number of columns, which is really nice. It gives a bunch of information about all of the variables. It, you can see here that it's giving us um, this double thing here, which is actually the, the class of the data. And then you can see a sample of, of the data for quite a way. So this is like, I don't know how many rows, but 15 or something like that. So we get a pretty good idea of what the data looks like just from this one function. Uh, but sometimes you still can't quite, quite get a sense even using glimpse because it was the first, what, 10, 15 rows. But maybe this is a data set that has 1,000 observations or 30,000 observations. Um, and then it's not quite clear what's going on there. And so to take a look at this, I highly suggest this uh, function called slice sample. If you type slice in, you'll see that there's actually a lot of slice functions in the deep layer package. Um, we're not going to go through a lot of them because they overlap kind of what we have already talked about. Slice tail and slice head is basically head and tail, uh, but it's the tidyverse version. Um, but head and tail are fine as well. Uh, but sample is a bit different. So sample in R often indicates that we're doing some sort of random sampling. And so we're going to put in the name of the data object that we're interested in. And then we have to put a number of rows that we're interested in looking at. So say I wanted to see four random rows. I would type in four, and this gives me four random rows. If I do it again, I get different data because it's just randomly pulling four rows. Um, so this can be a good option. The nice thing too is you can also look at the proportion of the data. So if you wanted to look at a quarter of the data, you could use 0.25. Um, oops. So here we can say proportion equals, and we get a quarter of the data, which would not work out if you're using something that has 30,000 observations, but you get my point. All right. Um, so now we're going to talk about how do we get these data frames and tibbles. Um, the other day, yesterday, we read some data in. Um, and today we're using some data already automatically in R. Um, but how do we get a data frame versus a tibble? So there's a data.frame function. This is a base R function. Um, so here you see base as the name of the function or package that it's coming from. Typically, that's where you'd see the package listed. Um, and so data frame itself, the, right now data frame is a data frame, but if you were needing to make it a data frame, you could do so using the, the data frame function. So this is a redundant use of the function, but that's how you would do it. Um, of course, we would need to rename this into some new object if this were not already a data frame. 
what I mean by this is, and this is an important thing to keep in mind, um, when you print, run a function without pointing it to some new data object or to the same data object to overwrite it, you're just printing it to the screen. So this doesn't change anything. Um, but if we wanted to say, make a new one, data frame two, then we need the arrow and data frame two. And if we looked at our environment, we would see that we now have something called data frame two. I can verify that by using the head function. Um, and if we wanna just overwrite the existing data frame um, using whatever function we're using, whether it's data frame or something else, uh, then we need to use the same name. This is just an important thing that is often easy to overlook when you're beginning in R. Um, and so keep this in mind. Can, we got a question in the chat. Can you remind us really quick what, um, what is a data frame maybe in the context of other kinds of um, objects or variables in R? Yeah, so we're gonna go through that a bit, but, um, and we're also gonna talk about this more in the days to come as well. But uh, so we've talked a bit about uh, vectors. So we made these, these simple um, data objects that are basically a really long string of, of uh, characters or numbers. Um, and a data frame is something that looks like a table. And so when we're looking at data frame here, we see this table that has rows and columns. And here, the way it's displaying, because I have it kind of narrow so it'll fit on the screen, it's just printing out the last two columns uh, below the rest of the table. Um, and yeah, we'll discuss this a lot more in just a bit. Okay, so uh, when we're creating a data frame, Yesterday we were using the read.csv and the read underscore CSV function. So I just wanted to really um, describe what, what each of these are doing. So there's really just a, a base R version happening and a tidy verse version here. So the dot version is this base R version. And so when we load in a file, and um, if you're Following along, this file does not exist in your document, so this will not work for you um, if you copy paste this code. But if you had a file on your in your documents in a directory called data analysis called data underscore file.csv, um, and you loaded this, this would create a traditional data frame, which would look like this. Um, but a tibble is the is the tidyverse version, and it's a bit fancier. So actually the function itself is doing less, but it will display the uh, data in a fancier way that will be more informative, which will be clear now. <laughs> so now we're using the, the dplyr uh, package. Um, again, I'm just showing this for you so that you see what package it's coming from, but all you actually have to do is use the tibble function. Um, and this is actually in two packages it's in a, a function, sorry, in a package called Tibble, um, and then dplyr is borrowing this. Um, but so basically we can take this data frame and we're gonna make a new data object called Tibble uh, from this data frame. And you'll see that it looks a little bit different. Um, so now it'll say at the top that it's a Tibble. It gives us the dimensions which is nice. And it gives us information about what all of the columns are. So this is very similar to what we saw with the glimpse function. Um, so we don't really need to use head here because it automatically just shows us a portion. We can see that there's 22 more rows and also another variable that it wasn't able to print out. Um, whereas if I type in data frame, which is the data frame version of the same data, then you know it prints out the entire thing. So if I wanted to just see a preview, I have to use the head function or something like that. So that's another advantage of the tibble. So if you wanted to just simplify it for yourself, just focus on tibbles because um, they're a little bit better. So to create a tibble, 
instead of using read.csv, you can automatically create it with read underscore CV, uh, which is the read our function that we were using yesterday. So again, we're just putting the path to the file um, and creating a new, um, in this case, a, a tibble. So we could call it TBL, um, but they're kind of interchangeably described as, as data frames because really a tibble is a fancy version of a data frame and it's, it's a data frame because it looks like a table with rows and columns. So just to recap, base R, you can make data frames using the data frame function, or you can automatically read one in using read.csv if you're using it from a file. Or uh, for the tidyverse version, you can use the tibble function to create it, or read underscore CSV. And like I said, uh, we generally recommend tibbles because they are a little bit, um, they're a little bit nicer for things. I see that there's a question about tibble versus glimpse. Um, so it's not actually rotating the data itself, it's just rotating it for you to look at. Um, so when we do glimpse data frame, and then I actually look at head data frame, it's not changed the data in any way. It's just when we're performing the glimpse function, it's going to rotate it for us to see it this way. And this is nice if you have a lot of observations. Um, you know, it's, it's harder to, to get a sense of, or actually, if you have a lot of columns, it, it's harder to get a sense of what your columns look like because you can only print so wide across your RStudio console. Um, so it'll just continue displaying them further down, um, which is nice. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so um, Glimpse kind of gives a Tibble version of what your data looks like. So we still don't have uh, a Tibble version of the object called data frame. This is still a data frame. So if we typed in, this is a function that we'll go over soon, but if we type in class, it, it gives us data frame. If we type in this for Tibble, we see that it's still a data frame, still a table but it's a fancy one. So it also gives us information that it's a tipple data frame. Cool. All right. Now, um, yeah, we, <laughs> this is kind of what I was gonna show in a second, uh, just showing them back to back, um, the differences between the two. Uh, one important thing that I didn't yet tell you is that tibbles get rid of row names. And this is a problem for this data set because we have row names. So you see that we have our car information as uh, the row names for data frame when we look at the first two lines using the head function. When we look at the tibble version of the data frame, and this is just printing the tibble version, otherwise we could also say head tibble because that's the tibble version that we made two, and we get the same output. Um, but notice that we've lost the car information. And that's a bummer because if this data set is about cars, we probably need that. Like maybe we don't care about how many gears it has, but we probably care about the name of, of the uh, car. And ideally we never want to lose any data that might be interesting to us. So luckily there's this nifty function called row names to column, which is fairly um, a fairly well named uh, function. So it means that we're going to take our, our row names from um, our data frame, because remember in the data frame version, we have row names, and we're going to make them a new column. And to do that, we have to specify what is it that we're working with. We're working with data frame. So I'll type in row names to column. And then data frame is the object that I'm working with. And I don't want to use the Tibble version because it doesn't have row names. So I have to use the data frame version. And I want to make a new variable with the name car. So I have to specify that with the very ver argument. Um, and so to do that, I this will just print it. Um, now I have a new 
variable named car. But again, I just printed it if I wanted to actually modify data frame to keep this, I would need to do this. So this would overwrite data frame. And now when I look at data frame, I see that it's changed. Um, and so here, we're just putting this inside of head so that we can look at just a couple of lines so that it prints nicely on the slide. Um, so now if I wanted to make a Tibble version of this, now this is what we want. We have it as a Tibble version with all of these fancy things that we like, but also we have the car information. So good to keep that part in mind. Um, make sure you don't lose your row names. Okay, moving on to re Um, someone's getting an error that they're not getting row names to column. Um, so you need to have loaded um, dplyr for that to, to work. So you can run this. Um, and then, oh, sorry, this is actually from Tibble. It's hard to remember which package <laughs> is for everything. So. do this and then it should auto populate as an option. All right, renaming columns. If you work with collaborators, sometimes you'll have um, data sets that have very oddly named columns that you'll want to change. Um, and so there's a really nifty function called rename that we're going to use to change that. Um, it's a little bit, if you've used base art, it's going to seem slightly confusing um, because the order in which you're doing things is a little bit different. But basically, um, this top chunk here is to show you the, the general format. This is not code, so don't type it in to your console or copy paste it. It won't work. This will work. This will not. Um, but I just wanted to show you that we're, we're either we're putting the data that we're either overwriting or newly creating um, up to the left of our arrow, like we always do. Um, in this case, I'm going to overwrite um, data frame. And um, these functions work on data frames or tibbles. And I'm going to say that I want to rename. Um, and then I need to specify what data I'm using because this is just calling whatever the output is data frame. So I still need to say that I need to use data frame and that I want to change MPG to be uppercase. So I need to put the new name that I want first, which is to me a little bit counterintuitive. Um, and then the equal sign uh, and then the old name. So now if I look at data frame, Oops. Um, so in this case, I'm just using tipple to actually look at the data frame. That's another way of doing it. I can see that the, the name of the second column is now uppercase. I could also use head. Um, so that can be really helpful. But sometimes you want to change all of your names. So maybe they're all lowercase or and you want them all to be upper or they're all uppercase and you feel like your data set's yelling at you and you want them to be lowercase. Um, so those are both options. Uh, there's a to upper function and a to lower function. And to use these, you'd want to use the rename underscore all function. So now we're gonna change everything to be uppercase. So we're gonna say, um, in this case, uh, we need to we want to overwrite our data frame. When we use our data frame, um, we want rename all. If I don't remember which one it is, I can read here and see what it says. And then data frame is the data that I want to use, and we want the two upper function, which is actually front base. Oops. And now. 
if I look at the top of my data frame, everything is now in caps. If I'm like, oh, whoa, why did I do that? That's, that's weird. I don't want that. Then I can do the same thing in reverse with two lower. Oops, sorry about that. All right. So now we are ready for lab part one. I think we have, oh yeah, um, right. Very good point, Ava, that loading in the entire tidyverse is a, is a great option um, to avoid those errors where it says that it doesn't recognize a function name. Um, okay, so we're gonna go into our breakout rooms. Okay, so um, I know that one of the students is having some installation issues. Um, if the TAs wouldn't mind continuing to help with that, um, we can also help with the breaks and um, perhaps after after class in the office hours. Um, okay, so moving on to subsetting columns. So sometimes we don't want to look at the entire data frame, we just want to look at a particular column. And there's a base R way of doing this, which involves um, using this dollar sign um, operator. And so we write the name of the data frame and then the dollar sign and the name of the variable that we're interested in. So I think I still have data frame. Yes, I do. So I look at data frame, say this time, instead I wanna look at car instead of carb. Um, I can do data frame. It gives me the options. I can click on one of them and then it will print out just that column. There's a tidyverse way of doing this, which is using the poll function. Um, I personally found this name a little bit counterintuitive, but if you think that, about the fact that you're pulling it from the data frame, you're taking it out, um, I think that works well. So in this case, we use the poll function. We have to specify the data that it's coming from. And then we use a comma this time, just like the syntax that we're typically used to. And we specify the variable that we're interested in pulling out. Or if we wanted to do car, I get the same output. There's also a function called select, which is a little bit different from pull, but it does almost the same thing. But the difference is instead of printing it out as just a sequence of numbers or, or words, um, it creates a nice structured tibble. So if I change in my command here, I'd use the up arrow to get the command I just did and I modify it to be select. Now I see that this, I have a variable named car and it's printed out in a much more organized structured way as opposed to just, um, you know, displaying all of the values. And so this can be useful later because sometimes you need your data to be in a vector form, which the poll function will do. And other times you need it to be in a tibble form. Um, and so it's nice to have both of those options. The select function is also great for just changing your data frame and keeping it a data frame, which we'll see in just a second. Um, you can also use pull around the select uh, function. So you can do something like this, um, which will give you the same output. So basically what we've done here is we've taken our data frame and we've, we've made it just one single column and then we're pulling it out so that it's no longer in the structure of a data frame, but it's just a, a vector. Um, but the real utility of the select function is, is modifying our data frame. So we can select different um, columns and, and use this to say we only are interested in, in MPG and cylinders and we don't really want the other variables, then we can make a new data frame that just has those. And that's um, really useful. This case, so I 
Oops. Yes, periods will not work. Live coding. <laughs> um, so in our case, I think I've um, already gotten rid of my row names in the data frame when I was working in my R studios. That's why I don't see my row names here. I'm not working with a tibble here. I'm working with a data frame. So that's why I, I see row names here and I don't see them here. This is also a data frame here, but I, as you may remember, I moved them with the row names to column name. So it's a, it's a column here. There are some really, really nifty functions that can help you to select columns. And this can be, this can save so, so, so much time. Um, so sometimes you'll have a huge data frame with a bunch of columns based on, I don't know, an, a day of the week or something. And so each column has a prefix that has something to do with the day of the week, or it has to do with the site that you're collecting data from, something like that. And so it's, it's possible that you might want to, to grab columns that start with something or contain something or end with something. And so, these tidy select functions help us do that. So if you're curious about those, you can type in tidy select, and then you'll see all of these different functions. So here's contains, um, ends with, starts with, etc. And we'll show how some of those work. So I know some of that was a little bit tricky, and we're we're getting into really using some R now. Um, but I hope that um, we're starting to appreciate the difference between tibble and data frame and select and pull and all that. Um, and you know, with more time, it'll it'll become more comfortable. So now we're going to talk about subsetting rows, which I think is super useful. All right. So the filter function is really great if you're working with rows and you want to subset your data by some. Uh, value aspect in your rows. So for example, in our data frame that we've been working with from empty cars originally, um, which you know looks like this, we have uh, some mile per gallon information uh, for these cars. And say we want to know which cars get pretty good uh, mileage per gallon. And so we, we want to specify that we want to filter this data for only the rows that get greater than 20. So we're using the filter function, which comes from dplyr. We specify what data we're working with. We say what variable we are interested in filtering by. And then we, we need the greater than function. Um, and here we see that there's 14 different rows for that. And we don't need um, to do any some sort of selecting uh, or specifying for the MPG that that's a column. It automatically knows that it's a column within the data that we're specifying uh, with data frame. So there's a lot of other options besides greater than. We can also do less than. We can do equal to. Um, a note though that when you do equal to, it is exactly equal to. So if you have a number that may have been created from uh, calculation, it might have some other digits that aren't being displayed. And so if it if equals two isn't quite working as you expect, that is why. And um, we can also do not equal to. The exclamation mark is used to indicate negation or not. Um, we can do greater than or equal or less than or equal to. Um, you can also do compound statements with and and or. And sometimes this is a hard, a hard button to find on your keyboard or key to find on your keyboard. On my keyboard, it's below delete. Um, sometimes there's a line in between. So it looks like a line stacked on top of another line. Um, if you have trouble finding yours, let, let us know. Um, okay, and then there's also this in operator that can be really helpful. So if we wanna specify certain values that we're interested in and we don't wanna say filter MPG equals equals 20 and then filter data frame MPG 
equals equals 21. And again, with 22, uh, we can instead just use this, this in, in um, operator. So we're specifying that we're using the data frame as our object that we're going to be filtering from. We specify the variable that we're interested in filtering on. And then, you know, this is parent signs or percent signs around C around in, and then you list the values that you're interested in. And I'm gonna try something a little bit different as another example. Um, it doesn't have to be in order. You do have to spell filter right though. So check that out. All right, in this case, uh, we're, we're getting an error. Okay, so we can get it to work now with just one value. I think we don't have a lot of values. Um, that are equal to those. So as we see here, actually, this is the reason it's not working. There are no 20 values and there are no 22. Uh, so that's why we're, we're not getting that to work. So let's do um, 21 and there we go. So that's how we would do that. But yeah, if you don't have that exact value, it won't show up. Um, okay, and then compound statements. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. You, you use this and if you're wanting to look for rows that are greater than 20 for MPG, but are also, so and is sort of akin to and also, where they have exactly four cylinders. So in this case, all the output is going to have four cylinders and greater than 20 MPG. You could also use a comma here. But the OR statement will give you a larger output because it's going to filter any row that is greater than 20, but also any row that has um, four cylinders. Um, so we have now some rows where cylinders are equal to six um, because they qualify based on the first statement about having greater than 20 MPG. And now we will go back to lab. Mute it again. All right. I think it automatically does that. And that's why I'm surprised every time. Okay. Um, so moving on. Um, so you can do some even fancier things now by combining filter and select. Um, so you can do what's called nesting, where you put one function inside the parentheses of another function. And so here we're nesting the filter function inside the select function. So what we're saying is we want to select um, cylinder and uh, the HP variable, but after we also filter a data frame for MPG greater than 20 um, and cylinder where it's equal to four. Um, we're also going to later talk about another way to do this, which is probably more optimal and a little easier to read because as you can see, this can start to get a little bit, a little bit difficult to understand. Um, you can also do it piece by piece where you can assign, you know, you can do one step first and reassign the object and then do the next step and reassign the object. But a very useful option is what's called piping. And so this is a kind of funny looking operator that's two parent, uh, percent signs around a greater than sign. So it's kind of like a fancy arrow. And um, in this case, we can see 
each time we have one of these that we're going to break into another step. And so it's basically sequential steps. Um, if you're into using um, shortcuts, you can use command control, shift and M, um, or you can just type, type the actual characters themselves. Um, so in this case, we are doing the same exact operations, but this time we're using piping. So we're going to take the data frame of interest. That's the first step, which, you know, um, makes it a little easier to see what data you're working with because it's always the very first thing. And then you pipe it into what you want to do. So what we want to do next is filter uh, like we were before, and then yet another pipe into the select step. Um, it is important to note that the order in which you do your steps can change your results sometimes. So be careful about how you're thinking of the order in which you're doing things. Okay. Um, so now we're also going to talk about adding or removing columns, adding variables. So Sometimes it's, it's helpful to do this um, because you want to, to have more information than what's already ready in your, in your data. So there's a base R way of doing things, which is to use the dollar or money sign, dollar sign, um, to assign a new, a new variable. So this one doesn't exist yet. We're making a new name and we're calling it new column. And then ideally we'd use the assign arrow, not the equal sign. Um, and then we would say that we're trying to make it from um, a column that already exists in the data frame. So we're going to use the weight variable that already exists, and we're going to divide it by 2.2. And then when we look at the top three lines or rows of this um, data frame, we see that now there's a new column that's got values that are equivalent to the weight column divided by 2.2. In the tidyverse, there's another way. Um, we want to show you the non-tidyverse base way because you'll probably end up seeing it when you Google for things about R or use certain resources. Um, that, and if you're used to base R, it's one of the hardest things, I think, to break away from if you've been used to doing it. But um, the mutate function is super powerful, and um, we'll be talking about a bit more about it later. But we can use it to make new functions and also to modify existing. Um, sorry, make new variables and also modify existing variables. And so the notation uh, kind of looks like this. So again, this is not code. You can't run this in in R, but it's going to look something like this, where we have our object that we're trying to update, the data that we're trying to use, which might end up being the data that we're trying to overwrite, which is the case down here. Um, and this, again, should have been an arrow, although equal sign works, but an arrow is more uh, the common notation. Um, and we're going to use the, the new variable name and the new variable source with equal sign in between. So we're making a column called new column. And we're using the existing weight column and we're dividing it by 2.2. In this case, we have to use an equal sign, um, which is similar to like when we use rename. And so we get the same output. Um, if you want to get rid of a column, sometimes you have a redundant column and you want it to go away, you can use the base R way of saying equals null um, and you know, specifying it with the, the dollar sign. Or um, you can use the select function from dplyr, and you can use this minus sign to negate the column name. So say we added the new column and we don't want it anymore, then we can say select with minus and the name of the column that we want to get rid of. Otherwise, you can just, this would be um, a little bit cumbersome, but you could list all of the column names that you wanted to keep. Sometimes that's easy because they all contain the letter H or something, and then you could use the tidy verse, um, or the tidy, tidy helper functions to uh, select those particular columns. 
You can also remove more than one at a time by using um, the combine function. In this case, the minus is going to go on the outside so that you're um, removing both of these. Okay, ordering columns. Sometimes we want to rearrange the way the columns are, are ordered. So we can do that in the way that we select them, actually. So um, this one might need proof because it seems unbelievable. Um, here's our, our head data frame here. Um, make this a little bigger. And let's say that we want to select like this. Copy, yeah. Um, you can see that cars now, it was the first variable, but now it's, it's the last one. Um, so that's one way that you can rearrange. There's also a really helpful function called relocate. Um, and so it has these arguments dot before and dot after that you can use to uh, rearrange things. So, for example, in this case, we're saying that we want the weight variable, which is located here, to be the first one. And so we can do that um, by saying before MPG, which is the first one here, because in this case, we're looking at a data frame, which is why we have row uh, names here without a header. And so, but you can also do this with a, a tipple. Um, and so here we have oops, what our data frame looks like. And when we run this code, We can see that in this case, we have a, um, we brought car first on this data frame in this version of the data. Um, and so first, when we look at it, we're, we're moving now to in front of before MPG. So any, in this case, we're moving it to be the second one. You could also do dot after, and you could say dot after um, cylinder, and that would move it in between cylinder and I'm not sure what disk is for, but whatever that stands for. So now we see that it's behind cylinder by using after. OK, we can also order our rows, which is very, very helpful and something that I use commonly. Um, and to do this, we use the arrange function. I see that we have some chats. Oh, thanks, Ava. Um, so we're, we're going to um, use the arrange function to arrange by specific uh, variable. So um, if we look at our data frame, um, right now, the top rows that are showing up have a value of, of 21, and we want it to be in ascending order. So we want it to start with the smallest value for MPG. So we can say arrange data frame by MPG. And now it's printed with the smallest values for MPG first, all the way to the largest. Down here. But sometimes we don't want it like that. We want it to be in the opposite order where we want the largest values first. And to do that, we would say in descending order. So we use the descending function inside. So we're nesting it inside the arrange function. And now um, we see that we're starting out with 33 and we come down to 10. Again, if we wanted to save this, this is just printing it out like this, but if we liked this and we wanted to keep it, um, we would have to assign it 
two data frame. So take a look at data frame and see it there. Um, so you can actually do combinations of things. So say we want to do it by um, decreasing or descending H HP. So we want to start with the largest amount of HP um, and the lo lowest amount of MPG. Um, it's going to preferentially, I believe, do the, the variable that's listed first. Um, but in this case, you can do some nice arranging um, by multiple variables. 